for a moment before we begin, I really want to speak on everyone's behalf and, and thank two individuals. Um, one individual, everyone might not realize how much we should thank him, and that's Aaron Shalom. Uh, so many of these uh, tefillah concepts in this tefillah project, Stuart keeps on telling me I keep on thanking him, but I should really be thanking Aaron. Uh, Aaron, I, I think, uh, for anyone who's heard his beautiful comments, insights on tefillah over these past weeks, uh, it's very, very clear that he has a, uh, a passion for spirituality and wisdom, uh, certainly beyond, uh, beyond his years. Uh, people say that kind of beyond years stuff to me a lot, so I like saying it to someone else now. <laughs> but uh, but uh, no, but really, we, we, we thank him very much. So much of this is really thanks to his uh, creativity and thank you very much. And we, we look forward to many more wonderful ideas and initiatives in our community and in Cloud in general. And thank you very much. Um, I also really want to uh, thank Stuart very much. Um, I was very moved. I was just thinking about it today. As, as many of you know, Stuart just finished his uh, Avelos. He lost both of his parents with overlapping Avelos periods. And, and the, the, his second parent who passed, his mother, the Yorkshire was just a couple of days ago. Uh, I, I was really reflecting on it. Um, for so many people, understandably so, when they mark the passing of a loved one, it's, it's such an uh, emotionally tumultuous time. It's all they can do to just keep their bearings in whatever it is they normally do. And the idea of during this period to initiate and start uh, new projects is, is really a very inspiring thing. And uh, just to note for a moment, the whole concept of saying kash when one loses a parent, uniquely when one use, loses a parent, more so than for other relatives, is that it's considered a tremendous merit for the soul of the departed that their child should invite others to say, Yehei Shmei Rabbah. That's really the idea of the Kaddish, that their child invites others to say, Yehei Shmei Rabbah. So I was just reflecting this afternoon. What a remarkable schlis that these two people have a child who has inspired others to not only say Yehei Shmei Rabbah, but to really work on their tefillah in general. So it's uh, the, all of these different projects and aspects should be a, uh, a tremendous schlis for both of his parents, the Shamos, and thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Um, I've got good news and bad news. Uh, you can decide which one is good and which one is bad. My guess is there'd be varied feelings in the room. Uh, so I have two pieces of news. Um, one is this is the last segment in this session, and we need to finish. Um, so, so the. Um, the, we really, God willing, we're going to have a hard stop at 9.15 because you know what happens? If we don't finish Shimona Esrei by the end of this night session, we have to start the whole thing over. That's, you know. <laughs> um, so I, I do have to apologize that uh, I think we're going to have to uh, be a little bit tighter on, on comments and we might not even have time. I'll, I'll, I'll kind of, I, I have a goal of 15 minutes per section. In my mind, I have it's broken up into three sections. So you'll just forgive me. I hope we'll have time for comments and questions. I think it greatly enhances uh, the discussion. But um, I do want to finish, and I don't want to keep people late either. Um, the not keeping people late part of my book is good news. I'm sure you all agree to that. Okay, uh, we're, we're, on, we're, we're on the bracha of motim, uh, the bracha of giving thanks. If you remember from last time, we discussed that the last three brachos in Shemon Esri, remember these three brachos, this is the second of a three bracha set that comes up at, every, at the end of every single Shemona Esrei. This is sort of like a, a wrapping up. This is not really asking for things anymore. So we discussed last week that the bracha would say is, is just hoping that God finds favor in our prayers. Not because if he finds favor in our prayers, he'll give us this or give us that. He'll just, we want him to find favor in our prayers. So modem now is just a general giving of thanks to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Uh, it's very interesting that Rebar Yonker suggests that part of the significance of Modim here near the end of the Shemona Esrei is we actually give thanks for the whole tefillah experience. Um, it could be that he means that we assume there are things that we've asked for that God is kind of putting his little book that he'll give to us, uh, but probably he means more than that. Probably he means that just the whole opportunity, and we'll see some comments that touch on that, the whole opportunity of praying to God is something for which we owe him a debt of thanks. 
Um, it is interesting, the, the Rebar Yakar points out a Medrash. The Medrash says that in the end of days, let's say in, in the Messianic times, there are many types of korbanos that people bring. And, and if you look at the Torah, there are many types of korbanos. There are communal korbanos that are very much affiliated with, with holidays and, and then special and Shabbases and things like that. And then there are personal korbanos. A person commits this sin, they bring a korban. A person commits that sin, they bring a korban. It's, it's uh, one of the earliest sources for Jewish guilt. You know, if you've not, I'm just kidding. But, but uh, you know, different, different korbanos for, for, for different sins. And there's also a concept of korban toda, of, of a thanksgiving offering. Actually, the concept of korban toda is, is the, the forerunner for what we think of as benching gomel. In other words, the idea that there are certain things for which a person benches gomel, what it really originates from is there were certain things that in the times of the base of Mikdash, if you had that experience and you survived it, you were obligated to bring a korban toda, a thanksgiving offering. So the Medrash says that there'll be a time that the other korbanos aren't brought. Or Chaim says what it means other korbanos aren't brought is these other personal korbanos, such as sin offerings. But the korban toda will still be brought. The thanksgiving offering. There's going to be a time where we're in a different place. We're really not committing sins anymore. Obviously, there's all these ways to understand what a messianic time period will be like. But even so, the opportunity and the concept of bringing a thanksgiving offering will still be in effect. And the access to Rebbe Yaka could be why modim comes after the bracha for tzei. So the bracha for tzei, on some level, touches on the bringing of korbanos. And so then after all of these korbanos, after all of these sacrifices, is modem, which kind of mirrors this idea that the Thanksgiving offering is, is this last, last type of offering. Okay. Modim anachdulach. I, I think we mentioned this last time, but I also just want to emphasize that the way it's broken up in many sidurim is somewhat misleading. Baruch uh, Hashem machazir shechina sol is that's, that's the last bracha. That's not part of the bracha modem. Modem is, the words modem is a new bracha. And I'll also, uh, just we have uh, a number of, of potential chazanim in the room. I'll also just mention that a very common and understandable error is um, the way it's supposed to go is the chazan says, I'm achzir sol The congregation says, Amen. And then the chazan and everyone say, everyone say, Many chazanim you'll hear say, I'm achzir shechina sol tziyon, You know, so it's, it's really, it's two separate things. Okay, modim What does the word modim actually mean? Uh, it's very interesting to read by Yakar. Uh, actually brings a source that modim <coughs> literally might mean to bow, which is just very interesting, of course, we bow and we say the word modim. Um, but more traditionally, we say that modim is a language, could be a language of thanks, like toda, but what it really normally is understood as is it's a language of admission. To be moda to someone, I admit to you, you know, you're, I admit that, that you're correct about something. So obviously those two words, admission, and giving thanks are, are very much related when you think about it. In other words, if I, if I recognize that you've done a great thing for me, I, I'm giving thanks to you. I admit that you've done a great thing for me. So it doesn't necessarily have to be as part of an argument, but the point is I, I come to a recognition. So the Rebbe Yoker says that we could be coming to a recognition of three different things. One thing is the most evident. We just believe God has done so much, so much good for us. And that, that at its core is what the Bracha Modim is about. Another possibility is it's a recognition that you are our God. Second possibility. And the third possibility is we give thanks to you for listening to our prayers. It doesn't have to be one versus the other. It could be all three of them. Thanking God for the good that he did. Uh, thanking God for being our God. And thanking God for listening to our prayers. Um, I, I once, uh, I believe I've shared this in show before, but I once heard a beautiful, beautiful story of a person who was some type of young mentor type who used to tell his uh, students that it's essential every time you say modim, at least once a day, think of five things that you are grateful to God for. Like, you know, before you actually say the bracha modim, just think about five things. A very nice thing, very concrete thing to think about. And of course, if we're really thinking about it in a very real way, different days we might say different things. Okay. Um, so just say we, we give thanks to you, we recognize it about you. That you are Hashem, our God. 
and you are the God of our fathers forever. Rav Schwab suggests, I think we can really relate to the importance of this message in our day. Rav Schwab says, maybe what it means, we give thanks that you are Hashem our God, is we give thanks to you for giving us the clarity that you are Hashem our God. Right? How many, how many of our brothers and sisters have no, have no recognition of, of, of a Jewish understanding of God? Right? How many stories do we know of people who, who, who are born Jewish, who um, go to all these cults and this and that because they're looking for spirituality? And it's so sad because we actually believe we've got a good amount of spirituality. So the fact that we are even able to say, Sha'atu Hashem Elokeinu, that we're able to recognize you are Hashem, our God, that's something of which we, for which we owe you such a great debt of gratitude in its own right. And the fact that you've conveyed to us this ability to pass on from generation to generation, of course each generation has its own free will, we of course know that, but the fact that remarkably we're able to pass this faith on from one generation to the other, that's also something for which we give thanks. So you're our God, and you're the God of our fathers. We give thanks for both things. Okay. Sur Chayenu, you are the rock of our lives. Mogen Yishenu Atahu Lador Vador. You are the shield of our salvation from generation to generation. Uh, Rav, Rav, Rav Schwab just points out over here that when we talk about God being a shield, it's remarkable to think about how many times we're protected that we have no idea, that we don't even know that we're being protected. He gives an example. Think about infections, right? So how many times, how many germs are constantly passing? I don't mean to make anyone nervous, but how many germs are, are constantly passing? Think about every time you go on an airplane. How many, how many germs, and this and that, and every now and then we get sick. It's just a remarkable thing to think about. Who knows how many uh, invisible dangers uh, you have all around. He makes a really interesting comment. He says, you know, the part talks about like mazikin, which are like these invisible bodies that do damage, and it sounds very uh, uh, Kabbalistic something. He says, who knows? Maybe that's talking about bacteria. You know, I mean, it's an interesting thing to think about. Okay. And, and we believe that God really, we know that God protects us so much. Nodelcha un saper secha. We'll give thanks to you and will tell of your praises. It's an important thing to think about, to be diligent about sharing, reflecting on it ourselves, but sharing with us. And some parents to tell all the great kindnesses of God. Uh, there's a concept, I'm sure many here have heard of it or participated. Every now and then people have what they call a sudas hoda, uh, a meal of, of thanksgiving. And it's a very inspiring thing. And it's a, it's, it's a great opportunity to share with people um, when they, when the person feels they were saved in a very unique way. And, and the, by the way, the idea of the Korban Toda, the Thanksgiving offering, was a very large amount of food. And you had a very short time to eat it, something like two days and one night, something like that. And um, I think it's the Sforno who says that part of the reason why that's the case is because he wa God wanted to create a circumstance that encouraged you to bring other people together in the eating of your korban toda, because that would compel you uh, to share uh, that for which you're giving thanks in the first place. Interesting. Okay. Al chayenu hamasurim yadecha, for our lives that are given over to your hand, v'yal neshmoseinu hapkudos lach, and for our souls that are given to you, given to be under your watch and care. Um, think about when we say an Adon Olam, in your hand, I give over my spirit when I go to sleep and when I wake up. That's what we're talking about here. When we go to bed at night, we believe it's a kindness from God that we wake up the next morning. It's those same souls that are given over to God's care. And your miracles that are with us every day. Again, it's, it's, we have to be able to see those miracles. But the miracles are there. Beyond the flow, secha v'tovo secha, and for your wonders and for your goodnesses, shabachol es, that occur at every time. Erev v'avok erev tzoroyim. Evening, morning, and noontime. 
on a literal level, of course, we're talking about evening, morning, noon, is the point is, at all times of day, we're constantly benefiting from God and from God's kindness. Um, Rav Schwab suggests, and, and many commentators say something like this, I just happen to see it from Rav Schwab, that we all have different types of times in our lives. Sometimes in life, it's, it feels like it's night for us. Things feel kind of dark, things don't seem to be going the way that we want them to go. That's Erev. Sometimes uh, things are beginning to turn around. Uh, the, the sun is beginning to come out. That's morning, Boker. And sometimes it seems like all cylinders are running just so. And, and everything is, is, is just, just right. And so Orion, that's like midday. Where the sun is at its greatest strength. So the point is, in all of these different types of circumstances, we give thanks to you. We recognize at the best of times that the reason why things are going so well is thanks to your kindness. And we recognize at the worst of times that even if it's hard to see it, we do believe you're there, we do believe you're helping us in some way. Maybe we just can't appreciate it fully. And of course, everything in between. That's Arab of Okay, which is all right. It's a very powerful thing to just think about. Um, Hatov Kilo Chalu Rachamecha. The good one, that your compassion has not run out. And so many of these things are, are references to Sukkim. Just for time purposes, I'm not going through each one. But this one, I just, I just thought I would share. The Rebbe Yerka points out, this is like what we say in Hallel. Hodul Hashem ki tov, give thanks to God for He is good, for His kindness is eternal. That's what we mean when we say ha tov, the good one. Like we say, hodul Hashem ki tov. Um, so your, your compassion has not run out. And the merciful one that your kindnesses have not ended. May Olam kivin lach. Forever we yearn to you. It's another Rav Schwab comment. He just says that it's also something for that, inherently for that which we should give thanks. Um, thank God so many of us are so good at staying determined and not giving up. And, and that in of itself, may Olam kivin lach, the fact that we're constantly yearning for you, no matter what else is going on in our lives, no matter how many times we've, we've, hit, we've bumped into a wall before, that fact that we have the energy to keep on pushing, I, I, I'm sure many of you could say the same thing. There are people who I know, who I have the great honor of knowing, who are going through such things, and you say to yourself, it's, it's remarkable this person can get up in the morning and do everything they do. And, and that's a little bit of a sad thing, but even in that sadness, it's remarkable. And the fact that, that we have that type of energy, and that type of determination, is in of itself something to give, give thanks to God for. Okay. V'yal kulam. And for all of these things, Yisparach v'yisumam shincham alkeinu tamid v'yolam v'ed. Your name should be blessed and praised our king forever. The Chola Chayim Yoducha Sela. And all of life will give thanks to you, will recognize you. Um, I don't know if this is going to explain every time, but I don't know about any of you. Whenever it says Sela, it always, it always takes me for a little, uh, a little twist. The, the greatest proof that Sela should take us for a little twist is I could be wrong, but. I believe I've seen before in the great art scroll English, it translates Sela as Sela. And if art scroll doesn't know what to translate it as, that means something. Um, so what does... What did you say? Okay. Um, but, so uh, the Reba Yonker at least explains... I'm sorry, uh, sorry. Other one, Bershwap. <laughs> explains Sela explains as being a language of absolute. In other words, it's a language of... So the Chola Chayim... He says the fact that we say all of life by ending it with a sela, it means really everybody. Now what do we mean here, really everybody? So he has a very nice concept. He says, no matter what's going on in someone's life, no matter what's going on in someone's life, they are compelled, if, if they're thinking, they are compelled to give thanks to you. Um, 
It is also interesting to think about the word chol and all of life. But the Rebbe Yochari actually says, we have a famous idea that righteous people, even when they're no longer of this world, they're still considered alive. It's quoted in many different contexts. So the Rebbe Yochari actually says that's what it means, b'chol people who are physically alive and people who are spiritually alive. Just an interesting thing. Um, one more comment, this is based on a medrash and a pasuk, but the Chol HaChayim, the Rebbe Yachar says, part of the definition of being alive is being able to recognize and to give thanks. So the Chol HaChayim, all living things, should be able to give appreciation to you. And they should give praise, they should truly praise your name. Kel Yeshua Seinu, Be'ezra Seinu, Sela. Our God, the God who is our salvation and is our help. Rav Schwab says that Yeshua Seinu means our salvation means when he actually helps us get through the problem. In other words, he saves us from the problem. He eliminates the problem. That's when God is a Yeshua, right? A person is in a dangerous situation and they get saved from the situation. That's a salvation. A person, heaven forbid, is ill and they're cured. Not everyone does get safe. We know that it doesn't happen necessarily. So he says, that's the Pshat and Ezra saying, the one who helps us. And uh, it's interesting, when I first was reading what he said, I thought, oh, Ezra saying means he helps us through it. Which, which I think you could still say that. If Schwab says something else, if Schwab says Ezra saying means that if for some reason things don't go the way we would like them to go, there must be some reason for it in the big picture and this must maybe for the world to come, who knows, but this is for our good, for our help in some way or another. That's what he says. But also you can appreciate the selling that, that we really recognize that no matter what's happening in a person's life, they're benefiting from God in some way. Baruch HaTu Hashem, HaTov Shimcha, Ulechana El Hodos. We, we say about God that your name is good, your essence is that you do good for us, and it is appropriate to give thanks to you. What an interesting comment. It's appropriate to give thanks to you. So Rav Schwab suggests that what we're talking about here is even if it's hard to see why we should be giving thanks to God, because things aren't going the way we want them to go, we recognize that we still need to give thanks to Him. Again, maybe that's finding the silver lining of things. Maybe that's believing there's a wider lens here than we have. Something. The Rav Schwab suggests that that's the Pshat. We bow twice in this bracha, right? We bow. And yet, Baruch HaTu Hashem, at the end here, HaTov Shimcha Lachano El Odos, we bow. This is a famous Gemara. The Gemara says we're obligated to give a blessing to God for the negative things in our lives like we give for the positive things. Of course, the most stark example of that is, heaven forbid, when we lose a close relative, we make the bracha, when one tears kri of dayan ho'emes. So that, that's, that's the, the classic example of that. So, Rosh Shrab suggests that the vowing at the beginning of the bracha is giving thanks for things that are obviously good. And the vowing at the end of the bracha, when we say, Atov shimchol chana el it's fitting to give thanks to you, even if we don't necessarily always understand it, is that's when we bow in submission to God and the statement that even if things aren't so evidently good for us, we bow them to, in, in, in submission and thanks. It's an interesting concept. Um, two very quick concepts that I am, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't think we're going to be able to take comments at this juncture, I apologize. Um, the modem the Rabbanon. Isn't that a strange thing? So the Chazan's repetition, right, and... Um, gets to modem, and all of a sudden, as he's saying modem, the congregation is saying something. Which is different, it's, it's a different text than he's saying. So the pessimist in me says, you know, the rabbis understood that we have to be able to talk to because of our shots. <laughs> Sorry, but uh, I don't think that's really the shots. But, uh, um, but um, the, the Rebbe Yagar explains, but he's citing the Gemara. The Gemara says, when we get to modem, the Gemara says, so what are the people in the congregation supposed to say when you get to modem? So basically, five different rabbis of the Gemara all said, well, they should say this, they should say that. And basically, this that we have, what's called the modem of the rabbis, is a combination of like the five things that they said. What's fascinating is they all, in one way or another, said this, this uh, penultimate line, Al Shanach Modim Lach. On the fact that we're able to thank you, 
that's something inherently that we give thanks for, that we have the recognition and ability to thank you. But why, why does the Gemara take as a self-evident concept that here there should be something for the people to respond? Why don't we just assume that when we make a bracha for uh, helping us come closer to God, what's the congregation going to say there? So the basic concept of Rebbe Yerker says, you see from here, excuse me, that it must be that when we're giving thanks to God, there's no way that we can sit idly by when someone else is publicly giving thanks. It just couldn't be. I mean, yeah, it's, it's a fascinating concept. I'll give you just, just a very uh, mundane example of it. How many times you're sitting at uh, a lovely prepared Shabbos meal and there's a number of people at the meal and someone says uh, to the host or hostess, whatever it is, you know, uh, this is really, uh, this is, you know, this chalant is delicious. So at that point, by the way, everyone feels compelled to say, yes, it is. So the question is, do you want to say, yes, it is, or do you want to have something specific to comment on? Right? I mean, we've all, we've all been there, right? And it's, sometimes the first person just grabs the, says it better than you, we, we can, and we just all have to say, right. But that doesn't feel so good. In other words, what, what's best is if the first person gives, says the chalant was delicious, and then someone else says the kugel is great, and someone else, you know, and, you know, and so on and so forth. We feel like we should be giving some concrete thanks. More than just a main. Right? So that's essentially, so in all the other brachos, we make these specific requests. So yes, yeah, so we make a request of God, or we make a general statement. So yes, yeah, so and the other people say, agreed. But specifically when it comes to giving thanks to Hashem, we're compelled to do more. That's an interesting thing to, to think about. Um, uh, just a twist, where Schwab says that it must be that the nature of this modem is, is more a communal type of thanks. Now why exactly this wording, uh, we don't have the time to go into now, but just the whole fact that we have a special text said by the congregation during the modem of the Chazan of is fascinating. Just as an aside for Chazanim, the Chazan is supposed to say this loudly because it's part of the repetition. Uh, uh, the fact that the congregation is also doing its thing, that's not the Chazan's problem. He's, he's still supposed to say it loudly. Okay, okay, we'll, we'll go on to the next program. I'm sorry, but just for time purposes. Um, Shalom. Shalom is, 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 is the closing breath of Shona Esrei. Um, there's a Medrash that talks about how powerful peace is. Because there are a number of things that the closing word of it, the closing concept, is peace. Shmona Esrei. Again, even though we have this page afterwards, but the last bracha of Shmona Esrei is the bracha about peace. Benching. Hashem Ozlam Oitein Hashem Yivrech Samov HaShalom. It's the last word of benching. Kaddish. Right? Oseh Shalom B'Ramov, Oseh Shalom. Right? By the way, Berich HaSkwanim also is, is, is the same thing, right? What's the very last word of Berich HaSkwanim? Shalom. It's interesting to note yeah, during the Chazan's repetition, this is where we, we put Birchas Kohanim. So we just came out of the great value of Shalom. That was the last word from Birchas Kohanim. Whether said by the Kohanim or by the Chazan, it was the last word. And now we go into the Bracha of Shalom. Um, the Abudraham says a really interesting thing. We know that in a sense, this Shemona Esrei is taking the place of bringing a korban, bringing a sacrifice. That's a, a common idea in prayer. So after the Kohanim would do their service, they would bless the people. And of course, the closing word of the Kohanim's blessing is Shalom. So it's fitting that at the very end of the, of the Shmona Esrei, our bracha, like kind of taking a page from the Kohanim's book, our bracha is about Shalom. OK. Um, now, the question that was posed last week, and I'm really grateful it was posed last week, because it was in the forefront of my mind, was this really sounds like a request. I mean, the, the, if you take this bracha, this bracha really feels like it should be in the middle of Shmona Esrei. So we just gave a nice idea as to why it should be the last bracha, but I would like to see if we can fit in a little bit more of, of, of something that fits with how we've been explaining with saying modem. I, I have a thought. I wish I saw someone explicitly talk about it. Unfortunately, I didn't, but I have a thought. So we'll, we'll, we'll see, but, but kind of keep it in mind as, as we go through. Okay. Sim shalom, tova uvracha, chein v'chesed v'rachamim. Aleinu v'akho Yisrael amecha. Rav Schwab points out that we have three mentions of shalom 
in this bracha. Okay? This is the first one. Place, peace, goodness, blessing, favor, kindness, compassion onto us and onto all of Israel. He suggests that the meaning of this first request of peace is a sense of inner peace. And, and a lot of these words, again, I, I don't want to take the time, but a lot of these words you can see could very well fit into kind of a person's emotional, spiritual state. So we, we ask God that he should give us a sense of being at peace, and not only for us, but for all of Chal Yisrael. Barcheinu avinu kulanu ke'echad pa'ur panecha. Bless us, our Father, all of us, as one, with the light of your face. What's this thing about all of us as one? What's, what's that all about? It's nice, it's, nice, it's nice flowery language, but what's the significance of it? So the Avudraham says that we know Hashem is Echad. Hashem is one. There's no one in comparison to him. Um, Abraham Avinu, the, the first of the patriarchs, is referred to somewhere as Echad, as the one. And we as a nation are referred to as in God's eyes being one. So basically we're saying you're one and you should kind of relate to us as, as your special nation. That, that's what the Abu Jum says is Kulanu Kechad, all of us as one. Bo'or Panecha, with the light of your face. The Rebbe Yakar says that this is a reference to Birchas Kohanim. Yo'er Hashem Panabe Lecha, God should shine his face down upon you. So this is kind of like taking a page out of Birchas Kohanim, which again, makes sense in the context of Birchas Kohanim preceding this, but in any event, this was a model for blessing of Klal Yisrael. Bless us with the light of your face. Now, the Sefer Hasidim makes a fascinating point. If I were to ask you, what was the moment of greatest revelation for Klal Yisrael? Harsina. Harsina, right? Now, by Harsina, we're told that Klal Yisrael was Kol Yisrael Arabim Zelazah. That all of Klal Yisrael took mutual responsibility for each other. Um, which, to say it differently, and this is the point the Sefer Hasidim makes, this implies that if even one member of Klal Yisrael would have said, I'm not interested, that would have taken away from the whole experience. It's a famous idea, I'm sure many of you have heard it before, that like every letter of the Torah represents one soul in Klal Yisrael. The numbers are difficult to work out, but, but, but this is such a Kabbalistic idea. Okay, so the Sefer Hasidim says, that's what it means, bless us all as one with the light of your face. Because the greatest revelation to Klal Yisrael was only because they had unity. Um, what, probably the second most famous example of revelation across the board of the Jewish people is the splitting of the sea. It's not as explicit over there, but you have this famous idea that, um, uh, you know, that the language in the, in the Medrash is uh, a maidservant, that the sea would see more than what, Yich, what the, the Navi Yechezkel saw. Right? So there also, Klal Israel was united. So that, that's the Sefer Hasidim's point over there. So it's fascinating to think about that in the context of a bracha that's all about shalom. So we recognize that we're not going to have spiritual clarity if we don't have national peace. If we're not united, we're not going to have the same level of revelation that we could if we were united. So that's what the Sefer Hasidim says is the pshat, Bless us all as one with the light of your face. Because by the light of your face, you gave to us Hashem our God, a Torah of life, and you've given us a whole attitude of loving kindness. And, and uh, I'm not sure I, you, you could understand this. I guess this is like a charity type of language. It's stuck up. And blessing and mercy and life. This shalom and peace. So Rav Schwab suggests that this shalom doesn't refer to internal peace. That was what the first one is. This shalom refers to the peace between people. 
right? So we realize that we're not going to get what we can and get where we would like to be if we don't have peace between each other. By the way, he also mentions that a Torah Sechayim, a living Torah, the whole phrase, a living Torah, implies a dynamic Torah, which implies constant exchange of ideas, constant passing from one person to another, constant exchange of ideas. So it's all about human interaction. Torah Sechayim. Okay. The Tov Beidecha, and it should be good in your eyes, to bless your nation Israel, at every moment and every hour, presumably ace is like every infinitesimal moment, and Shah is like more extended periods of time with your peace. And this, Rav Schwab suggests, refers to peace between nations. But, so it's his point is here, the first peace is about an eternal peace. Help us be at peace with ourselves. The second piece is about help us be at peace with each other. The third one is help us as a nation be at peace and not be endangered by other nations. Again, we can certainly relate to the wording here if you go with this shot of every moment. Right? One never knows. You know, and, and there are all these dangers that we don't even know about. It's true for, for so many countries on the planet. But it's certainly for cloud so. Baruch atu Hashem hambarech esamo Yisrael v'ashem. That we, we, we bless you, that you bless us with peace. So first I just want to share, Rav Schwab suggests, I did not see it if he fully completed the thought, but he suggests we have three peace, we have a, a three-pronged type of peace here. So he says, that fits Birch HaSkawanim, in the sense that there are three verses in Birch HaSkawanim. So I don't know if you notice, Whenever we have birchas kohanim, we say sim shalom. And when we don't have birchas kohanim, we normally say shalom rav. Right? In other words, in, in the chazan's repetition, we have birchas kohanim and shachris, but not at mincha. So shachris say sim shalom, and mincha we say shalom rav. You know, it's open. Whereas, you know, uh, Shabbos mincha, we have birchas kohanim. You know, so according to some, we say sim shalom, whatever it is, etc. Whatever it is. So he suggests the reason why they have the longer version is because it's supposed to be co coming on the heels of Birch HaSkonim. So like this three-pronged aspect. Now, back to the question that we began this bracha with. I, I, I think the point here is, if you understand the bracha, we just explained it, we're asking God for inner peace, we're asking God for interpersonal peace, we're asking God for peace from other nations. Presumably the point of all of it is so that we can serve you properly. Right, you know, this talking about God's Torah, so I think it's a little bit different than, let's say, the requests in the middle of Shemur Esther, which were like, give it to me because I would like to have it. This, again, is God, we think that we can serve you properly if we have this peace. I don't know if that's really the pshat, but I, I, I think possibly. Again, the most basic answer to why the last bracha is shalom is this thing, that that's the, there's a famous quote from the Mishnah, that enkli maxik bracha ela shalom, that the true vessel which holds all blessings is peace. It's an interesting thing to think about. It's a powerful thing, a little bit of a muster to think about a little bit, that, that how many times are people striving to accomplish this in their life and that in their life, and the one thing they don't have is internal peace and tranquility, and until they get that peace and tranquility, it all kind of falls to the wayside. It's an interesting thing to think about. Okay, we're going to move on to the last section, and I hope we'll finish the last section with some time for some comments. Um, okay. Now... Technically speaking, we just finished Shmon Esra. Um, technically speaking, there'd be an idea of saying, I'm Varek Samoyed Shalom. Perhaps this, this Pasuk you know, that I have, at least in my art school, Yul Arat Sonim Refi, which we say later on in the Kainan Sur, but that's like a basic. This Pasuk is the other end to Hashem Svasai Tftach of Yagi Tilasecha. That was said at the beginning of Shmon Esra. May the words of my mouth be favorable to you. The thoughts of my heart. God, my rock and my redeemer. This is like the polar opposite in terms of the other end. So technically, we'd say, we would take three steps back and we'd be finished. In fact, I, there's not the time to go through it now, but there are many halachos of things that you can interrupt. If you're at this point in the Shemona Esrei, you can answer many more things that you can if you're in the middle of Shemona Esrei. Uh, because technically, Shemona Esrei has just ended but this is sort of like the after part. Um, the Gemara in Brachos, 
talks about the concept of having things, basic requests that a person makes at the end of Shemona Esrei. And it's our practice to say it as a standard formula. But this is also somewhat of a combination of things that different rabbis from the Gemara said in that discussion. Okay. Elokai. Now it's fascinating. I just want to point out, we've, we had the discussion many times over the series. Shemona Esrei in general is in the plural. And all of a sudden now, we've gone to the singular. Elokai, my God. Nitzur l'shoni meira, guard my tongue from, from bad, etc. Everything is me all of a sudden, because this is not Shemona Esrei anymore. This is just a very personal, um, it's almost like I don't know what's going on, I don't know what the guy next to me is saying, but this is what's important to me. So right now we do know what the guy next to us is saying, but, but, uh, but theoretically we, we didn't have to. Um, and even if we didn't have Sidur, surely they'd be putting it on their Facebook account what they're saying in their personal accounts, you know, at the end of the Shemona Esrei. Guard my tongue from evil, and guard my lips from saying falsehood. Um, it's remarkable that this, this is the basic request right out of the box, help me not say the wrong things. Uh, Shrav just comments, you see how, you see from this how much of a challenge it must be to not say the wrong things. I didn't need him to tell me that, I didn't need Shemona to tell me that. But uh, it is interesting, there's a famous mashal from the Chafetz Chaim uh, that's all about how if we want our prayers to be meaningful and, and, and acceptable before God, we need to make sure that the vessel by which we relate our prayer, our mouths, uh, is pure. So it's actually, if you think about it in that light, it's extremely fitting that we begin with this request. You know, I, I just spoke to you such holy words. Now just help me to not, you know, taint my mouth Otherwise, the rest of the day. Okay. Vilim kalalai nafshi sidom to all those who curse me, allow my soul to be quiet. The Rebbe Yakar says that if I'm asking you to help me not say the wrong things, give me the strength to keep my mouth shut if people say rude things to me. That's a significant request in its own right. And my soul should be like dirt to all. <coughs> okay? Um, the Rebbe Yerker explains that this reference to dirt refers to Abraham. Abraham Avinu, when he's speaking to God, says, I, I, I'm dirt and ash, like what am I? So we should be able to live with humility. The Avudraham says the significance of the image of dirt is so many tread on dirt and stomp on dirt, and at the end of the day, they all need the dirt, because that's the only way things will grow. So dirt is symbolic of like, at now it seems like it's on the bottom, but later on it, it, it redeems itself. So our hope is, I don't need to get great cover in this world, I just hope that when it's all said and done, I did a good job. Um, there's a tosvos in brachos, a really interesting thing to think about. They are, you're gonna have a hard time destroying dirt. So it's an, a mushal that I, my soul should be like dirt, that my offspring should always flourish and should always exist and not be cut off, heaven forbid. Okay. Uh, Rosh Schwab says, Lim nafshi sidom, I should keep my mouth shut to those who curse me, and my, my soul should be like dirt to everyone, meaning to those who praise me, I, I, I shouldn't get too, too, too uh, swell, swollen <coughs> ahead to those either. In other words, I should always keep on, on the right uh, level. It's an interesting thing. Psach libi b'soro secha. Open up my heart to your Torah, mitzvah secha to dov nafshi, and allow my soul to chase after your mitzvahs. Uh, the Rebbe Yoker explains, we have two psukim juxtaposed to Hillel. Guard your tongue from ill and your lips from saying false. So that's what we said at the beginning. But don't just sit around doing nothing and keep your mouth shut. Make sure to not do bad things and go out and do good things. So that's the flow in the psukim here. Open up my heart to your Torah. Let, 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 let my soul chase after your mitzvahs. And to all those who think ill upon me, the Kalkel Machshav Tam. 
quickly uh, turn aside their, uh, their ideas and mess up their thoughts. Uh, the Avudram just explains that the fact that I'm so focused on my mitzvot should be a merit that should protect me against all those who, who wish ill on me. Okay. Aseleman Shmecha, Aseleman Yimidecha, Aseleman Kedusha Secha, Aseleman Torah Secha. Do this for the sake of your name, do this for the sake of your right hand, of the force, of the power which you bring on the world. Do this for the sake of your sanctity, do this for the sake of your Torah. And the Gemara Shmuel says, that a person who makes those four statements, those four do this for the sake of, with true kavana, a person who says that with true kavana, merits to uh, accept the presence, uh, God's divine presence. In other words, merits the great revelation. So Rav Schwab just says, because what's the pshat in these four lines? These four lines are, I'm not telling you that you should answer my prayers because I, I, you owe me anything, or because I'm some phenomenal prayer. Do these things because you're kind. So if a person really believes that, person really, really believes that their merits are not great and they just turn to God and above the gods and they really live that way, that in of itself is a great merit to get clarity of God's presence in this world. Laman yechotsun yididecha hoshiyo yomincha v'aneini. So that your beloved ones are saved, bring salvation with your right hand, and answer me. Um, the way this Pasuk from Tilm is understood is so that those who are very close to you, those who are very pious, are saved. Extend your right hand, right hand, the strong presence of God. That's like miracles. Vanemi, and answer me. Rav Schwab says, we had a similar idea earlier in Shema Nasser. Rav Schwab says, you know, do great things for all the pious people. Maybe stick me in there also. You know, like answer me too. Now we have this, this, this like core pasuk of the closure. Yudoratzonim refi begyam dubilu May the words of my mouth come favorably before you. May the thoughts of my heart come before you. God, my rock, and my redeemer. Um, the read by Yaakov brings Medrash Tehillim, who says as follows on the, that says as follows on this puzzle. Sometimes I have the ability to pray, to express myself appropriately with words. And for that I say you the Rod Son Rafi, that may the words that I express come favorably before you. Sometimes I can't put it together. I don't have the co to put it together. I'll tell you what I thought about when I, when I saw this. Sometimes I don't have the, sometimes I don't have the, the presence of mind to really think about what I'm saying. But I think you could also say sometimes there are things that are so important to us, and for some reason we can't express it. You're allowed to say things during the evening. This is actually an ideal place to say things right before you the road. So uh, you can say it in English too, just personal requests. So, for the things that I haven't said, just listen to Hagyomi be just the thoughts of my heart. Maybe I didn't say it well. Maybe, maybe I, I haven't even been able to express it. But you know what I'm thinking, and you know that I mean well. You should listen to that also. Then, we end up talking about peace again. Osesh Lomar Romav, he who, who does peace in his lofty realms, who ya Shalom Aleinu, you should bring peace upon us. Yisrael, and to all of Israel, you are main. And now we just have this postscript that talks about asking God, again, very appropriate to end off tefillah that way, asking God to bring us the base of Mikdash. This was one way of serving God, but there's a whole other way of serving God that we don't have right now. We should be zoka to, to bring back the base of Mikdash and, um, and have the merit of, of serving God in that way. One thing, I don't remember if we discussed this earlier in the series, um, Rav Hutner has an essay where he talks about the significance and the symbolism of the steps. Did we talk about that, the significance of the steps? No? No? Okay. Um, he says that, that um, prayer, you know, there's a fascinating halacha that when we walk, there's a merit in walking to show. Schar psios. There's a certain merit in steps. Um, that theoretically speaking, if, if all things were equal of two shuls I could dominate, and it's an equally inspirational experience, I actually am encouraged to go to the further away shul. And people may find me for buying a house far away. Uh, I'm encouraged to go to the, to, to the further away shul because there's schar psios. So it's a little bit of a strange, we don't have that concept in other, in other places. 
So he says that the whole experience of davening is all about coming close to God. That's what the whole experience is about. Um, so that a core part of the davening experience is taking the steps forward to God and taking steps backwards. It's actually interesting for certain aspects of tefillah, of Shemona Esrei, it's not considered over until I take three steps back. One tier is kind of what words I'm about to go around to is once I take three steps back, the Shemona Esrei is really considered over. Even though there's still words that I'm saying, once I take three steps back, I can interrupt for anything. I can interrupt to say Baruch Hu Baruch Shemona all of a sudden, once I take three steps back. But it's, it's this, this experience of, of coming close to God and then stepping away from Shemona Esrei. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure many people have comments. I'm, I'm really sorry. I, I, we have time for like one, but maybe it's better just not. Uh, please, Stanford. Yes. Um, one of my great teachers, he coined the expression normal mysticism. And that's exactly what, uh, what you were now speaking about. Uh, because he said, Kvodo male olam. The whole world is full of, uh, full of God's glory. So how is it that I can get close to God if God is everywhere? So he said, normal mysticism is that I take some steps forward. Anyhow, I'm going to get close to God. And then I can't live in God's presence that close all, at all times. So I take three steps back. So that's the normal mysticism. It's not, and he would go and he'd put his head down, you know, between his legs. He says, it's not that. It's just we take the steps forward and we bow, and then we take the steps backwards, and then we take leave of God. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, really thank you. I, I, again, I just want to reiterate, I, I think just the, 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 the size of attendance has been an extremely inspiring thing for me. So really thank you. Thank you everyone for coming. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Doesn't go over the jacket.